five decades of the World Bank in Uganda. Increasing power generation capacity and reliable accessibility for economic growth. Support to improving the connectivity and efficiency of the national road network. Providing support to the fight against the HIV AIDS pandemic. Improving health conditions through provision and access to safe water supply. Promoting competitiveness in the private sector by providing support for the implementation of business environment reforms. Support in developing agriculture technologies to increase agricultural productivity and incomes. And a lot more programs that growing societies and economies need to improve lives and help reduce poverty. Years of British rule are ending. October 9th, 1962. Uganda attains independence. The Uganda National Anthem, and our flag is raised. A moment of joy and jubilation as the country joins the club of other African countries that enjoyed self rule. At the time of independence, Uganda inherited a very strong economy whose per capita income was close to most of the already emerging economies of Southeast Asia. Agriculture was the major activity. The expanding manufacturing sector was potentially capable of increasing its contribution to GDP. Copper from the Kilembe mines was a very important national product that was fetching the country an annual income of over 500 million pounds. The Owen Falls hydroelectricity scheme was producing unprecedented power for industrial expansion. Already the manufacturing sector had registered dynamic growth, necessitating increase in power supply. To mitigate the anticipated growing demand for energy, the protectorate government one year before independence, 1961, had accessed a loan of 8.4 million US dollars from the World Bank to finance 60% work on extension to the existing transmission and the distribution systems at the Owen Falls hydroelectricity generating plant and small schemes with hydroelectric and diesel generating stations to supply the remote areas. This three-year program was the first World Bank-funded project in Uganda. It brought electricity supply to outlying areas of agricultural and other economic importance. So if you wanted to, to, to meet the requirements, social requirements, of Ugandans, hospitals, education, roads, railways, whatever, plus investments in those sectors, you need more money. In the period preceding independence, there was great disparity in the distribution of physical health infrastructure left from the colonial period. To bridge this gap, the World Bank supported the post-independence government establish 22 referral hospitals across the country, the extensive network of health units that greatly improved delivery of the health services to Uganda's outlying rural population. January 25, 1971. A military coup by Idi Amin. The beginning of terror and enormous tribulation for the people of Uganda. Idi Amin's eight-year rule produced economic decline, social disintegration and massive human rights violations. Uganda became a pariah state and faced various international embargoes. Many development partners, including the World Bank, were forced to stop their operations in the country. What continued was the, the projects with East African members of East African community. Because then we, as Uganda, we were a member of the East African community. And uh, therefore, we borrowed together for East African harbors. We borrowed for East African telecommunications. We borrowed for railways until 1977, when the community collapsed. The World Bank took the role of liquidating the assets of the community, the move that saw fair distribution of the assets among the three member states. That was a very, very good decision. 
and uh, not only for Uganda but for all member states, including World Bank. During the war that ousted Amin, Uganda's infrastructure and industrial plant had been largely destroyed. Such was the sorry state of Uganda at the time of liberation from Amin's excesses. The GDP declined. The exchange rates simply went out of this world. You had parallel exchange rate, the official one, and the Chibanda market. Production went down. Foreign exchange went down. The economy went down, and the whole economy was administratively controlled. In 1981, the government of Uganda made a dramatic break with the bleak past, and with the support from the IMF, the World Bank and other donors, introduced a series of financial and other policy reforms. You want to spend so that you build the infrastructure. At the same time, the IMF <laughs> would end up recommending austerity measures which is contrary to what you want to do. So it had to be a balancing act in the process. And so we had to learn by, ex by experiment. And, and that's why we ended up with monetary reforms. You had uh, all sorts of experiments at the time. As a result, there were some gains despite the negative impact of internal security problems. GDP grew by 5.5% and inflation fell to about 20% while the current account was in surplus. Because of the rigid monetary uh, system that was being supervised by the particular IMF, it was contained in a relative, inflation was contained uh, remarkably within a relatively short time, during that time. The lack of political stability continued to make it impossible to initiate or implement total economic recovery. It had marked impact on economic performance. Following a decade of lack of regular maintenance on the Owen Falls Power Station, Uganda's main power generating plant, in 1985, the World Bank, with funding from ODA and IDA slash CDC, approved a $115 million loan for the rehabilitation of the facility. This was under the government's recovery program whose basic objective was to rehabilitate the productive sectors and improve the existing productive capacities to meet the forecast economic growth. The project was made effective in 1986 and by closure in 1994, repairs on the structural damages in the powerhouse, dam and dam gates had been done. Seven hydro generators had been installed, thus increasing capacity from 150 megawatts in 1988 to 168 megawatts in 1993. On 25th January 1986, Yoweri Museveni and his guerrilla army took power following a five-year bush war which had started in 1981 against the Obote government. The new government inherited an almost bankrupt treasury under decayed economy. Inflation was running at 147% and the effective exchange rate had increased by 128%. Initially, the NRM government deeply opposed IMF programs. I think there was a view by the NRM that somehow this problem could be solved by ourselves alone. But quickly, by the end of 86, it was clear that we needed help. In May 1987, the NRM government accepted an economic reform program sponsored by the World Bank and supported by the IMF and agencies of the European Union. The IMF and World Bank both made it clear that for the time being, what was needed was to stabilize the situation. You can, you can compare this to stabilizing a patient. When a patient comes in a critical condition, you don't start immediate treatment. You, you try to, to stabilize the patient so that he can receive the medications you may have to administer later on. So the Ugandan economy was in a critical condition and had to be stabilized fast. There was not an issue of growth or development. It was merely how can we make things normal, uh, have a normal functioning of the economy. So I think the first very important measure was the World Bank giving us $100 million, lending us, not giving us, $100 million of uh, balance of payment support. 
that balance of payments support helped us to import goods, particularly what we were considered to be essential goods. Like any other sector at the time, the war left a great deal of the healthcare infrastructure destroyed and the health system dysfunctional. The government of Uganda made an elaborate 10-year plan to rehabilitate the destroyed health infrastructure on the advice from donors to have a major reform of the entire health sector. Government sought assistance to support its efforts. In 1988, the World Bank provided 42.5 million US dollars under the first World Bank Health Project, mainly for emergency rehabilitation of the health infrastructure. Its key focus was on three things. One was to rehabilitate the infrastructure that had been ravaged over many decades of uh, civil turbulence and uh, uprising. Secondly, it had to strengthen the program delivery uh, uh, through whatever infrastructure still remain. Uh, and thirdly, it addressed uh, 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 the efficiency and management. Besides, by 1986, Uganda was facing a threat of the HIV-AIDS pandemic, with the country's prevalence rate reaching 14%, subsequently rising up to 30%. An estimated 2 million people were infected, and nearly 1 million children left orphaned. Located in Rakai, the district where the first recorded case of HIV in Uganda and was subsequently hard hit by the pandemic, Rakai Hospital was a key facility built under the first health project as part of the mitigation efforts to contain the disease. It was reformed into a smaller hospital and then satellite hospitals in each of the counties. Now this started a new model of service delivery uh, that we now are familiar with. I think you call them health center falls. Sexually transmitted infections were substantially responsible for the growing spread of HIV. In 1994, the World Bank approved 50 million US dollars to finance the Sexually Transmitted Infections Project, STIP. The project was conceived to sustain momentum and strengthen the control of AIDS and other sexually transmitted infections in Uganda. To identify patients with sexually transmitted diseases, uh, diagnose them properly, treat them properly, and monitor them properly. In 1995, one year before the closure of the Fast Health Project, the bank approved 45 million US dollars to fund the district health services pilot and demonstration project. This was to supplement the outcomes of the First Health Project. To move policy from a technocratic approach to a consultative approach, which was in line with the new government, let's call it government philosophy of consultation with the people. There were local, gov local government structures, lo I think local councils, and all sorts of committees. Uh, this now uh, was in sync. The war against HIV AIDS was not over yet. In 2001, the World Bank approved 54 million US dollars to finance the multi-country HIV-AIDS project. The multi-sectoral project was, had come to, uh, to um, strengthen the achievements that the Sexually Transmitted Infections Project had achieved. Under the project, Uganda AIDS Commission, the national coordinating body, was given funds to construct a permanent home in Tinda. The commission coordinated and monitored the activities of the project. In HIV AIDS partnership, we have our structures. At national level, we have the AIDS Commission, but we also have what you call partnership committee, whereby the donors, the line ministries, and key stakeholders participate in the discussing the HIV coordination. So these structures were created and were supported by World Bank, and they were working. The district was able to coordinate the HIV response at this level, and the people moved in a harmonious way. Between 1987 and 1992, under the World Bank Economic Recovery Program, Uganda vigorously implemented the Structural Adjustment Program. A liberal economy policy was adopted to stabilize the economy. The granting of the soft loan of $100 million 
as balance of payment support from the World Bank came with conditions, what you call conditionalities. One of the conditions was that we remove price controls. Macroeconomic stability was eventually restored through prudent budgeting as well as fiscal and monetary policy. In the early 1990s, the World Bank strengthened the arm of what you would call reformers. These reformers did not cut across uh, the whole of government. And definitely those voices will be there, that World Bank is forcing down uh, reforms down the throat of, uh, of, of government. Okay? Maybe the World Bank also made its own mistakes. Could it have done it otherwise? Uh, faced with uh, a lot of opposition to some of the reforms. Would you have consensus on each and every reform in government? Maybe not. Yeah. That uh, the way to go then was to see how you strengthen the arm of those who had a better understanding and a better appreciation of, uh, of these policies. As part of the liberalization drive, the government instituted the divestiture program in 1992 to reform and divest public enterprises. At this time, there were 116 public enterprises. These enterprises were characterized by low productivity, endemic losses and huge indebtedness to government and the private sector. They constituted an excessive administrative burden on public resources and needed to be offloaded. For example, we no longer have a Uganda airline, as we used to have a Uganda airline. It became a nuisance. We didn't own an aircraft. We leased the aircraft from Australia. We leased an aircraft from Zimbabwe. We ended up hiring our pilots and the other staff. And at the end of the day, every end of month, we had to pay the rental for the aircraft and then also offset the expenses left all over, landing fees and etc. etc. And it was not making any money at all. Such that we ended, because we were putting in about 20 billion almost a month. So we ended up saying one day and said, look, we are stopping it. By the end of 2002, with assistance and technical advice from the World Bank, 103 public enterprises had either been sold off, restructured, or liquidated. The World Bank assisted in molding and improving the approach as they would bring transaction advisors and things of that nature, which we never thought of, that we would need to have a transaction advisor who would then have the duty of winding up what is the position? They have had accounts, they have, had, uh, they have been involved in this, they have been involved in the other. Uh, how uh, can this be done? And then how can we package this body for a prospective buyer? Most of the enterprises that were up for sale and the marketing, as you've termed it, was done by, by ourselves as, as government, of course with the assistance of, uh, of advisors. Which advisors we procured uh, with, the, with the support that the World Bank would make available to, our, to the government of Uganda. Today, many of these enterprises under the new owners have undergone tremendous transformation, leading to increased output, higher tax payment and more meaningful job creation. Tilda Uganda Limited, a rice production company in eastern Uganda, is one of the many classic examples of the success stories of the privatization program. Formerly a government parastatal under the Ministry of Agriculture, the enterprise was divested in 1997, at the time it had totally collapsed. The new owners made a turnaround of the company, recapitalized and revamped it with new modern machinery. Today, Tilda Uganda is the leading rice production company in the country, producing 20,000 tons of rice annually saving Uganda's huge foreign exchange that was spent on importing rice. Our primary objective has been to uh, substitute imports. Before we came in, Uganda had been importing significant quantities of uh, rice to the tune of probably 70, 80,000, 90,000 tons of rice. Today, Uganda, uh, you can say, is almost self-sufficient. Water supply another sector that was greatly devastated by the two decades of instability. Most hard hit were urban supply systems, which broke down. 
In 1986, the World Bank, in an emergency intervention, provided 28 million US dollars to the government for the rehabilitation of the systems in seven major towns. The seven towns component included uh, civil works, which meant construction of treatment works, laying of pipelines, storage tanks. After that intervention, we started feeling, getting hope that Yes, the water situation in the country could be restored to what it was, and even better, we started discussions with the World Bank and other donors for, future, for further support. Subsequently, in 1994, the World Bank went ahead to support the government of Uganda with $42.3 million under the small town's water and sanitation project to rehabilitate and upgrade water supply and sanitation services in towns that had not been covered. No doubt, the World Bank support has had tremendous impact on the water sector. They've gradually looked at everything, changed the thinking, our thinking opened us to new ideas, which has helped us not only improve in our work, but also improve um, on the outlook of the efficiency. Following the adoption of a free market economic policy, Uganda registered unprecedented rapid economic growth. This undoubtedly required sufficient energy to drive the potentially dynamic economy. In 2000, the World Bank approved a 33 million US dollar credit line for the third power project whose principal component was construction of the Owen Falls Extension Power Station a 200 megawatt hydropower station on the river bank of Victoria Nile River, immediately downstream of the Owen Falls Dam. With completion of the project, the generation capacity of the two main power stations increased to 380 megawatts. This power increase enormously boosted the country's effort toward prevention of power supply bottlenecks that would otherwise hinder economic development. Despite the country's commendable progress in sector reforms and attracting private sector investments, Uganda continued to suffer from chronic power shortages. Even with the significant addition of short-term thermal generation capacity in 2005-2006, the system was unable to meet its load in 2007. In 2007, the World Bank approved a 300 million US dollar credit line to government of Uganda for the power sector development project. 96% of the bank's financial support was committed to absorb a part of the high costs of short-term 50 megawatt thermal emergency power generation that was installed at Mutundwe in Kampala as a short-term intervention. The remaining percentage was committed to providing technical assistance and formulation of policy measures aimed at making the sector financially viable, accelerating rural electrification and moving towards a sector-wide approach for development. The medium-term interventions included development of 50 megawatt of micro-hydropower plants and other energy efficiency measures. In 2007, Work on the development of a 250 megawatt Bujagali hydropower plant began. This was in the implementation of private sector participation with private sponsorship, commercial financing and broad-based support from donors, including the World Bank. There are uh, four or so big financiers in this project. Uh, African Development Bank, European Investment Bank, uh, International Finance Corporation and uh, part of the World Bank in terms of support and other uh, financiers. Commissioned in 2012, Bujagali represents the third most powerful hydroelectricity energy source in Uganda, driving the economic growth and providing clean, reliable power for Uganda, thus meeting 49% of the country's electricity needs. The project has positively affected everyday life in the country, especially in urban areas, by helping to reduce the power cuts affecting thousands of households that had to endure 24-hour load shading at times. The elimination of widespread power cuts has also enabled businesses to increase their competitiveness as they no longer have to operate costly diesel generator sets and enhances the attractiveness of Uganda 
as an investment destination. This power should be able to contribute to the increment in consumption of electricity per capita in the country. In 2001, government received 61.27 million US dollars in financial support under the Global Environment Facility slash World Bank Renewable Energy Strategic Partnership for the implementation of energy for rural transformation project. The main objective of the long-term program was to develop Uganda's rural energy and information and communication technology sectors so that they would make a significant contribution to bringing about rural transformation. Under the Ministry of Water and Environment, 20 solar water pumping systems with a capacity of 195,960 watt picks have been installed and are in operation in 14 districts countrywide and in three different regions. The installation of solar panels helped provide water supply to the communities. Under the Ministry of Health, standard solar energy packages were developed and designed for various sizes of medical buildings and staff houses in different health centers and selected hospitals across the country. Under the Ministry of Education and Sports, 94 of the 129 educational institutions packaged under Phase 1 have been electrified using solar systems. Located in Iganga District, Bukonte Secondary School, the school with the highest student enrollment in the district, benefited from the project. Besides installation of the solar energy systems to provide power and construction of four blocks, the project built and equipped the school computer lab with 21 computers. The availability of this lab has prompted the school to make computer science a compulsory subject for all. In addition, the solar energy provided light, enabling students attend their evening preps. Over the years, the World Bank has substantially supported Government of Uganda improve the connectivity and efficiency of the transport sector. From improvement in maintenance of Uganda's 1980s deteriorated road network, improvement in access to rural and economically productive areas, to strengthening road sector planning and management capability that was part of the first road sector development program. Many of the reforms you currently see in place are a result of the initial World Bank input in preparing the road sector development program. Subsequently, the World Bank heavily supported government in the implementation of the many projects in the road sector. There are many projects that the World Bank has financed as an outcome of the road sector development program. First and foremost, the financing of Busunji Chiboga Hoima Road, upgrading it, upgrading of Karuma Pakwach, which is about 238 kilometers. They've also financed the recent upgrade of Kampala Gaiazas. Uh, the upgrade of Soroti Dokololera Road. They've also done reconstruction of some paved roads uh, in western Uganda, like uh, Fort Potohima, uh, Katunguru, Ishasha, Kikorongo. So they've financed a number of projects which total over about 700 kilometers. This support to the road sector has significantly addressed the bank's key objective of reducing poverty and increasing accessibility to the rural poor in Uganda. The World Bank has also extended its support to Uganda as part of the wider East African Community Cross-Border Transport and Trade Initiative. In 2006, the bank approved 281.67 million US dollars under the East African Trade and Transport Facilitation Project. Under the component of support to Kenya and Uganda Railways concession, 3.8 million US dollars was allocated for the rehabilitation and upgrading of the 1,248-ton MV Kahwa vessel at Port Bell. The vessel which prize Mwanza, Port Bell, Bukoba, carrying cargo has now been installed with modern navigation facilities, making it safer and more efficient. We do appreciate the new system because the yellow boat looks quite modern. The ship was given a GPS, global position satellite, position set something, and uh, the echo sounder. Under the investment support for trade and transport facilitation component, the bank financed the establishment of one-stop joint border posts at Malaba, Mutukula and Busia. 
The concept is to cut processes by half. The World Bank's support to Uganda's education sector has been phenomenal. From financing construction of post-independent secondary school infrastructure across the country in the 1960s, supporting teacher training, provision of scholastic materials, supporting both universal primary education and USE, to funding projects in institutions of higher learning. Located in Kasambia sub-county, Mubende district in central Uganda, Kasambia Parents Secondary School is one of the beneficiaries of the bank's 150 million US dollars post-primary education and training program, whose objective is to improve the quality and increase accessibility of lower secondary education. Here, the project built and equipped a laboratory block, an administration block, two classrooms, a stocked library with a sitting capacity of 80 students and two VIP latrines. These facilities have not only tremendously transformed the capacity of the school, but also improved the performance of the 792 students. The classes were over congested. We had classes of 120, 130. We didn't have a, a library, so the students could read. There was no organized way of reading. Students would read from anywhere, and the books were just in stores so they could not easily be accessed by the learners. Another beneficiary is Aduko Secondary in Maruzi, a patch district, northern Uganda. The two modern safe classroom blocks built by the project have given the students a feeling of safety and relief from the old, small, less ventilated classrooms. It has given us a learning conducive environment. It's very good, well ventilated, and above all, we have also the lightning conductor where we cannot just be trouble with the lightning. At Koro Senior Secondary School in Gulu District, one of the schools that had been displaced by the war, the project constructed two classroom blocks to cater for the increased number of returnee students. Today, there are 422 students in total, both in O and L level. The World Bank uh, came timely. Because from 2009, when we came back, we were having single streams all through. But from 2010, coming to 11, the population sizes started shooting up of the classes. So they really helped us timely enough to solve the problem of the growing population of the students. To encourage more students take up science subjects, the project constructed a block to house a multi-science laboratory. I have a hope that I will do best in science because of new, this new building. Through the Uganda National Council for Science and Technology, the World Bank committed 33.35 million US dollars to fund the five-year Millennium Science Initiative project, which was launched in 2006. MSI had uh, its objective of um, enabling universities and research organizations in Uganda to produce more and better qualified science and engineering graduates. And then also for these universities and research organizations to conduct higher quality and more relevant research. And for the private sector to utilize these outputs uh, to improve or increase their productivity and profitability and all this is for the sake of achieving a science and technology-led economic growth. At Gulu University, 1.25 million US dollars was put into creation of the Bachelor of Science in Biosystems Engineering with the goal of expanding access to higher education and promoting quality professional training in science and technology. Subsequently, a research laboratory block with four laboratories, tools, and equipment and other training facilities were procured. A modern agrometeorological station was installed. A networked computer laboratory was put in place to facilitate students in doing their research. The first fully funded 21 students were admitted for the 2008-2009 academic year. The project eventually funded a total of 76 students. 
Ariem Sunday is one of the few female beneficiaries of this grant. Seriously, if World Bank had not like come up with that, I would be doing a different course because I had already got uh, applied on private, of which my father wasn't actually capable of paying for that. At Kabale University, the MSI project funded establishment of facilities for use in upgrading grade 5 secondary school science and mathematics teachers to graduate level. These had diplomas to teach science and math, but they, did not, they needed to be upgraded to a degree level so that they are more knowledgeable in the subject matter to teach up to A level. Three labs of biology, chemistry and physics were remodeled from the existing facilities and equipped to be utilized by the project beneficiaries. We got computers, we got a vehicle, students from 70 districts of Uganda all converged at Kawa University and benefited from this project. At Basitama University, the project financed establishment of a fully-fledged department of textile and gening engineering, complete with a hands-on textile laboratory. The department is implementing the four-year training program, leading to a award of Bachelor of Science degree in textiles engineering. The main purpose of the program is to address the problem of inadequate trained and skilled human resource in the textile sector. Already, 20 pioneer beneficiaries have graduated from this course. Uganda Industrial Research Center, the lead agency for promoting industrialization in Uganda. In 2007, the institution received a 5 million US dollar World Bank grant under the MSI program. The institutional strengthening support administered through the National Council for Science and Technology went into renovating and enhancing the institution's infrastructure. This facility was transformed from a basic engineering workshop into a modern-day technology development center with capacity to adequately deliver services. What the World Bank funding allowed for was the establishment uh, of the facility, uh, going from the concept to actually having a well-equipped facility uh, that can actively get engaged in development of very basic technologies uh, that we have been importing uh, for many years at very exorbitant cost. A well-equipped world-class analytical laboratory that can enable researchers and analysts innovate and meet regulatory requirements was established. Also established was a business development center where people go to access information on industries. If there was some one specific uh, <coughs> thing I, I want to celebrate with this collaboration, is that they enhanced our technical capacity at Uganda Industrial Research Institute. So that now we can do a lot of uh, uh, analysis, we can do a lot of training, and we can even make uh, engineered products in our workshops. A cotton wool processing generi in Chiyunga, Kamuli, central Uganda. The ginery has capacity to transform bales of lint into 5,000 rolls of 500 grams each per day. This is one remarkable value addition breakthrough for Mutuma commercial agencies who adopted a more profitable approach of diversifying from exporting cruel cotton. 2008-2009, the prices of cotton dropped so much, so low, so that really it reached 39 cents per pound. Then we had to look for other alternatives if we, remain, if we have to remain in Cotton. The company was able to achieve this with the World Bank interventions under the Private Sector Competitiveness Project that was implemented by the Private Sector Foundation with the objectives of making the Ugandan private sector more competitive so that it can expand sales to both domestic and international markets. I wrote a proposal to Private Sector Foundation they helped me with $100,000 as a grant, and it helped me to, to pay back the money for, for machinery. 
Many private enterprises benefited from the Business Uganda Development Scheme component under the PSCP. And many have actually got a lot of equipment in terms of technology acquisition and been able to use this equipment to improve their products. We are counting more than 5,000 enterprises and these ones are mainly medium scale. One of the elements of that project was strengthening the newly formed private sector foundation as a voice um, of the private sector and as, as if you like, the, the think tank behind the private sector's recommendations to government. At the Call of Birds is a cost-sharing grant scheme in which Ugandan firms could receive 50% of the costs. Isiko Steven benefited from Technological Acquisition Fund, TAF, with a 15,000 US dollar grant to finance acquisition of equipment for his dried fruit business. I went and discussed with the officers in, in PSFU, and they told me, yes, I'm legal for that, and they would support me by 50%. The grant came at a time when Isiko's products had lost market in Japan because of failure to meet the required standards. With the new equipment, he regained his clientele. I'd lost my buyer from Japan already. If, if PSFU did not come to my rescue, maybe I could have done it later, but not at this time. So it actually put me in a bigger, uh, at a bigger level. And in addition to the current, the current Japanese buyer, I also added other buyers. Another key component of the private sector competitiveness project was support to the land administration reforms. One of the constraints they identified uh, in improving the, the business environment was actually the delivery of land services, uh, provision of titles for people to for collateral and so on. This unprecedented support provided for establishment and renovation of existing land administration infrastructure across the country, transforming them into 13 zonal land offices. A national land information center, the NAV Center of All Information Pertaining to Land Administration in Uganda, was constructed. All of these people uh, working in the, in the zones will be able to uh, back up their data at the National Land Information Center. We have also been able to transfer all the leasehold and freehold titles to all of these six areas we are talking about. So in effect, uh, all the leasehold titles and freehold titles have been computerized for the whole country. But the actual transfer we have done has been to these six areas. So people do not have to come here anymore from these six areas. Uh, they only go and present their papers and conclude all their business. Agriculture, the traditional backbone of Uganda's economy. In the 1990s, the annual agricultural growth surpassed 4%, boosted by Uganda's economic liberalization and complementary institutional reforms, including the agriculture sector. Despite these advances, Many of the rural poor did not benefit from growth and remained outside the monetary economy. Government realized that sustained growth, rural economic transformation and poverty reduction were first linked to advances in agriculture, realizing higher productivity and shifting production from low-value staples to higher-valued products. To achieve this goal, government established the National Agricultural Advisory Services, NADS. In 2001, with 45 million US dollar funding from the World Bank, NADS was empowered to implement its central objective of developing a decentralized, firmer owned, demand driven, and pluralistic extension system. We have a history with the World Bank that financed the first phase of NADS, uh, which was mainly to support agriculture extension services. Uh, so they provided financing. They provided technical advice, and really where we are now is, is, is a result of the immense support we got from the World Bank. In 2007, the World Bank provided government with a 38 million US dollar credit line to finance the Agriculture Research and Training Project. The project's fundamental objective is to support agriculture research and technology development and the transfer of technology and its dissemination to farmers 
with a view to increasing production and farm household incomes. Mbarara Zonal Agriculture Research and Development Institute is one of 14 public agriculture research institutes that are funded under this project. Adaptive research is done here to develop technologies suitable for this zone which are subsequently passed on to the farmers within the 13 districts in the zone. Banana is one key crop the Institute is taking keen interest in. We are working with the farmers and other stakeholders to try and help them combat the bacteria, banana bacterial wilt. But we also help the farmers to access clean planting material of improved varieties of bananas that increase production and which are resistant to some of the, the local diseases. In 2010, the government received 3.336 million US dollars from the World Bank to fund the setting up of the National Animal Genetic Resource Center and Data Bank as part of the wider East African Agricultural Productivity Project, EAAP. Headquartered in Entebbe, the center has a semen collection center stocked with selected quality bulls to provide semen for distribution to the 12 outreach government farms spread across the country and interested livestock farmers. The government farms which are stocked with hyphas act as outreach breeding centers for farmers within their localities to access better breeds. Rwona Farm in Kabarole District is one of the 12 government farms. Stocked with a 211 herd, the farm has become a valuable, beneficial resource to farmers in five surrounding districts. They get high-grade quality animals from us that improve their livelihood. Uh, the community, especially their children, have acquired skills from here through training. Apollo Makuru, a farmer in Bugaya Kabarole district, is one of the beneficiaries of Rubona Farm. At the time he accessed the service, Apollo had 24 animals. After introduction of artificial insemination, he was able to raise his herd from 24 to the current 96. <laughs> In 1989, the World Bank responded to Government of Uganda's request for support towards preparations for formulation of the country's National Environment Action Plan. Some kind of a framework that would enable Uganda to prepare a National Environment Action Plan. Which action plan would come up with the policy on environmental management in Uganda, the legal, the legislative framework, the institutional framework and the investment program for the environment in Uganda. So, the World Bank therefore provided some seed money. Seed money which enabled task forces to be put in place. And these task forces were put in place and started working in 1991. Uganda's National Environment Action Plan was subsequently adopted in 1994, following a four-year collaborative effort between Government of Uganda and other development partners spearheaded by the World Bank. Had it not been for the World Bank coming up to assist the Government of Uganda, I don't think that Uganda would have prepared and adopted the National Environment Management Policy, which was adopted, as I said, in 1994. Following the adoption of the Action Plan in 1995, the World Bank provided a total of 35.9 million US dollars to finance the first and the second environment management capacity building projects. Through the project, Uganda was able to recruit and train staff at the national and district level. There was a component on micro projects. Micro projects relating to tree planting, these were identified by the communities, tree planting on fragile ecosystems like on riverbanks, near wetlands, on hilltops, and so forth. Besides enabling NEMA acquire a permanent home at Plot 17 Ginger Road, which houses all departments of the authority, 
The project supported 13 municipalities across the country to put in place waste management facilities. Located 7 kilometers from Barara Municipal Central Business District, Kakoba composting site was set up in 2005 to handle tons of garbage that had posed serious environmental and health hazards. The facility processes 70 tons of garbage generated daily by the municipality, transforming it into compost for use in agricultural fields. It has reduced the, the heresy problem because when we compost, that means the garbage which would have rotten around, now it is being composted. It is, it is improve, improving on agriculture activities. Because the compost we produce here, we, take, we sell it to the farmers. Some of them we give them free. So it has improved on their livelihood here. Located on a 35-acre piece of land 12 kilometers north of Kampala, Mpedere Sanitary Landfill is the facility set up under the project in 1997 to take care of the 400 tons of garbage generated by the city daily. Here, garbage, which in the past was haphazardly disposed, is now sorted, graded and drained to extract the liquid component that is treated before finally being released into the wetland. The solid part is buried and compacted to create passages for the trucks taking fresh waste to the tipping front. Besides installation of treatment plants, the project supports the entire management and running of the disposal site. This landfill has extended three times. And every time we extend, we get money from the World Bank for the construction and even for the management. Uganda ranks in the top 10 nations in Africa in terms of animal species for all major groups and among the top 10 in the world for mammals, including over half of the known world population of mountain gorillas. Its concentration of biological wealth offers exceptional opportunities to achieve global biodiversity conservation objectives cost-effectively. In the early 90s, Uganda's protected areas infrastructure was crumbling. This circumstance threatened both the animals and the ecosystems of the national parks, as well as tourism, which depends on these natural assets. Subsequently, a number of development partners, including the World Bank, offered intervention in many areas. In 2002, the World Bank, in partnership with the Global Environment Fund, provided a total of 35 million US dollars to finance the Protected Areas Management and Sustainable Use Project. The project focused on parks infrastructure and accommodations for park employees, which were in extremely poor condition. In Windy Impenetrable National Game Park, home to over 400 gorillas, the project constructed and equipped the UWA office block, as well as permanent, decent staff quarters. Then they also helped us in uh, marking the park boundary. There are areas which were problematic. We have had to uh, 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 plant what we call canes. Similarly, in Queen Elizabeth National Game Park, park headquarters were constructed and equipped with modern communication systems. Accommodation facilities to cater for the 165 members were also constructed. Additional facilities such as connection to the main electricity grid and safe water supply system were put in place. The project also provided park patrol vehicles along with fully fledged vehicle maintenance workshops. From the late 1980s until 2006, Northern Uganda was plunged into a brutal conflict that was caused by Joseph Kony and his Lord's Resistance Army rebels. At the end of 2005, an estimated 1.6 million people had been forced to leave their homes to live in internally displaced persons' camps for fear of being attacked and or abducted by the rebels. When the war ended in 2006, Government sought assistance of the World Bank in executing the enormous task of resettling people back into their land. The bank provided a total of 233.5 million US dollars to fund the Northern Uganda Social Action Fund project, NUSAF 1 and 2, that runs from 2002 to 2014. 
The development objective of the projects was to improve access of beneficiary households in northern Uganda to income earning opportunities and better basic social economic services. The livelihood investment component supports income generating activities. 41 year old Odoj Justin lives in Wanglobo village, Lalogi sub county, Gulu district. He is a member of the 15 member Wanglobo goat rearing project, a NUSAF supported group. Odoj has been able to increase his goat herd from the original five that he got from the group to now 14. He plans to butter his goats for a bull that he will use to plough his land for crop growing to further improve both his income and diet. The project also provides support and encourages communities to identify innovative ways for community reconciliation and conflict management. The community demand component supports community-driven initiatives that improve accessibility to and delivery of social services. Lack of sufficient educational infrastructure was one of the major challenges faced by communities in the post-war northern Uganda. Under the new SAF project, a number of areas have been provided with classroom blocks, such as this one at Laminadera Primary School in Gulu District, to accommodate the large number of children of the returnees. Access to safe water is another key component of NUSAF. In Chubu, A and B village, Korosab County, Gulu District, a total of 97 households are now able to access clean, safe water that has greatly improved health. We are now drinking safe water. It also reduces the diseases that were, that, that were disturbing the people before in this area, like typhoid, even the worms, the diarrhea. Undoubtedly, Uganda's current economic and social advancements could not have been attained working in isolation. It has been made possible through concerted efforts with development partners, key among whom is the World Bank, who prioritize and value the needs and concerns of the country as the bank provides their support. When we get someone who not only is a lender but also helps us in the technical application, that is a good combination. And when I say technical assistance, I don't mean capacity building in a vacuum. But if you're, let's say, doing a road project, to help your people design the road, cost it, evaluate the benefits, so you can make sure that the project is well implemented. Um, I think the scarcity in Uganda is not so much money, though a lot of people will howl when they say that. Because right now, with the low interest rates around the world, especially in the Western world, there's no lack of money looking for good projects. What we need to do is to make sure our projects are relevant, well-designed, well-costed, implemented on time, and monitored to a fault. If we do that, then we'll get value for money, very good value for money, and the loan money will keep on flowing. Uh, the good news is that the World Bank has a, um, a mix of instrument that we can adapt as the country move up the development ladder. Uh, we have financial, uh, in uh, most cases, investment project. We have done budget support. As the bank's, uh, bank evolves, we are moving also to a pro the instrument that we uh, call Program for Results, which is in the middle between budget support and investment project. In, in a nutshell, it really depends on, on the country situation, uh, what's uh, the best instrument that is best suited really to address the needs of the, of, the, of the country. And this is the flexibility that the World Bank brings uh, on the table to, to, to best uh, meet the needs of the, of, of the country. The story of the World Bank Uganda partnership that spans five decades is a string of accomplished, mutually undertaken development initiatives that have had a tremendous positive impact on the lives of Ugandans as a people and Uganda as a nation in the bank's goal of ensuring a poverty-free world.